Hello and welcome. This is Cambridge O Level Chemistry Paper 2. The subject code is 5070. This is October November 2021 exam and this is variant 1 of this exam. So you will be given 1 hour and 30 minutes to solve this exam. However, I will be taking a little longer because I will be solving all the questions for you. So let's start. Section A. Answer all the questions in this section in the spaces provided. The total marks for this section is 45. First question, it says, choose from the following oxides to answer you, the questions. So you are given the following oxides, aluminum oxide, calcium oxide, iron oxide, iron, sorry, iron two oxide, uh, magnesium oxide, silicon dioxide, sodium oxide, and sulfur dioxide. Each of these oxide may be used once more than once or not at all. So state which oxide has a simple molecular structure. So remember, oxides are generally solid in nature. However, oxide which are gaseous in nature will be having molecular structure. So in the given list, only sulfur dioxide is an oxide which will be which is found in mole in, mole in molecular structure or in gaseous state. So answer will be sulfur dioxide number part 2 which of the oxide is a colored solid so remember iron 2 ion is colored ion so iron 2 ion will be a colored solid so iron 2 iron 2 oxide will be a colored oxide then contains ions with three plus charge. So remember, aluminum oxide is Al2O3. So, and this is Al3 positive and O2 negative. So this is three plus charge. So aluminum oxide, aluminum oxide is our oxide. Part D, which oxide is the product of thermal decomposition of calcium carbonate? So calcium carbonate, CaCO3, if you're going to heat it, you'll be getting calcium oxide plus carbon dioxide gas. So calcium oxide will be our, calcium oxide will be our desired oxide. Then part E, which oxide contributes to acid rain? So acid rain generally contains sulfuric acid. So if you're going to add sulfur, uh, sulfur dioxide to water, we'll get uh, sulfuric acid. So sulfur dioxide when mixes with rain and that itself is water. So it will give us uh, acid rain or a sulf uh, sulfuric acid as a part of it. So sulfur dioxide will, is, will be our answer. Sulfur dioxide is the answer. Okay, so moving ahead, question number two. It says dry air contains nitrogen, oxygen, noble gases, and carbon dioxide. State the percentage of oxygen present in dry air. So the percentage of oxygen is something between 20 and 21. So a good answer is, uh, say, approximately 21%. That is a good answer for this. Then part B. Carbon dioxide is removed from sample of air by passing air through aqueous sodium hydroxide. Explain why aqueous sodium hydroxide removes carbon dioxide from air. So remember, sodium hydroxide will be eating up carbon dioxide. So what will be happening? So sodium carbonate and water will be forming. So it will be something like sodium three, two, two plus H2 or something like this will be forming. So um, sodium hydroxide removal comes in. So, so remember this is sodium hydroxide is a base and uh, in air when carbon dioxide is in air it is somewhat acidic in nature. So acid plus base will give you salt and water. So we'll say uh, carbon 
dioxide is acidic in nature it will react oh, uh, excuse my writing with um, sodium hydroxide which is basic in nature or chair base to form salt and water hence gets neutralized okay so this is a neutralization reaction simple acid plus base will give you salt and water so this is how uh, carbon dioxide will be removed from air so next part question number c it says describe how oxygen nitrogen and noble gases are separated from each other after carbon dioxide has been removed so uh, remember fractional distillation can be or is a process that is used to remove these gases from air and fractional distillation works on the uh, principle of uh, 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 remove or principle of you can say uh, different uh, removing components from uh, a gas based on its boiling point so uh, that's how it is so we what we can write uh, is that the air is first uh, cool down and liquefied the liquid air undergoes fractional distillation where the detuent gases that is oxygen nitrogen noble gases are separated at different boiling points okay so this is how it goes then part d it says describe a test for oxygen so the best test for uh, oxygen is the burning splinter or a glowing splinter um, so uh, the test is bring a glowing splint inside a test tube containing <clears throat> oxygen. Uh, so observation the splint rekindles itself or relights itself and that is the uh, my very easy test for checking out oxygen or presence of oxygen then moving ahead quick uh, part E, it says ozone O3 is formed in the atmosphere by the reaction of nitrogen dioxide with oxygen in the presence of ultraviolet or UV light. State what is uh, what state the type of chemical reaction that takes place when ozone is formed in this way. So this is a photochemical redox reaction. Um, so uh, you can say just photochemical reaction. 
reaction or you can also call it as a redox reaction and then part two nitrogen dioxide is formed in internal combustion engines okay state one source of nitrogen dioxide in atmosphere um so very easy um if we have we can find uh, an answer of this uh in the upper part uh of uh, the paper that uh, say in the presence of uh, anything that gives uh, very high temperatures uh, that will be able to uh, form oxides or nitrogen dioxide from the internal combustion engine. And in the above case, we see that UV light. So UV light is actually from sunlight. So it may not be the reason causing. So another source of high temperatures in the atmosphere is uh, during the rain when lightning strikes. So that also can generate uh, 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 nitrogen dioxide from nitrogen available in the air. So lightning is another source. So you can call it lightning. Then uh, part F, a uh, layer of ozone is present in the high atmosphere. Yes, okay, state one problem for humans that can arise if the ozone layer is depleted by chlorofluorocarbons or CFCs. So basically, it, um, CFC destroys the ozone layer that results in harmful radiations of the sun reaching the surface of the earth, and that uh, that harmful radiation causes lots of different things. Uh, one is uh, leukemia or cancer, it causes cancer, um, causing radiations. Uh, Sunburns will be there. Eye damage. Um, you can also call radiation poisoning. Poisoning. Okay, so these are some of the uh, issues which can, uh, which the humans can face uh, if the ozone layer is depleted by the chlorofluorocarbons. So moving ahead, uh, question number three. It says. Iron powder reacts with dilute sulfuric acid, and the reaction is given below. So iron, iron is in a powdered form, solid, sulfuric acid, FeSO4, aqueous solution, and hydrogen is released as gas. The graph shows the volume of hydrogen produced at 20 degrees centigrade as the reaction proceeds. Okay, so this is the graph. Uh, you can see it from here. So first part, state how long does it take does it takes for from the start of experiment to collect 18 centimeter cube of hydrogen gas so let's see in the graph so it starts from zero and 18 is somewhere here so let's see how long does it take so it comes up here so if we go down so it is something like this so this is 18 centimeter cube from the gas and this is here so it is six minutes so we can say it is six minutes okay then it says number two part uh, the experiment is repeated at 30 degrees centigrade all other conditions are same draw a line on the grid to show the volume of hydrogen gas how the volume of the hydrogen gas produced changes when the reaction is done at 30 degrees centigrade so remember, if the temperature is increased, the, uh, the rate of reaction is faster. However, the concentrations of all the components remain the same. So the, the total volume will not be greater than the uh, value or the amount of, uh, or the volume of hydrogen that's already produced. However, the rate of reaction will be uh, much faster. And which me it means that the volume of hydrogen produced, which is actually somewhat around 35, centimeter cube will remain the same but that volume will be achieved much earlier so the graph will be something like this um, so the increase the rate of slope uh, follow this somewhat similar curvature and make sure it reaches 35 at an earlier time oh sorry this is uh, gone ab a little above so this is where i have to keep so not 35 it is 34 actually so make that correction please this is not 35 so we have to reach somewhere here so this is 34 centimeter cube of total volume 
Okay, so this is on the answer shoe. Let me write it as this part B, answer number, oh sorry, part A, answer number two. So let me call it as part A, answer number two. Okay, so this is how you draw your graph or, or draw a line on the graph. Make sure you draw it much better than what I have done. And I request you to please ignore, excuse my drawing. So moving ahead, um, so let me write it, done. So moving ahead, uh, part B, it says describe and explain using ideas about collision between particles, how the rate of reaction changes when the temperature of the reaction mixture increased. All other conditions are the same. So first of all, how the rate increases? So the rate of reaction increases. So this will give me my first point from this. Then I have to explain the situation. The increase in temperature increases the average kinetic energy of the particles the rate of collision increases because of this increase in kinetic energy. resulting in more number of successful collisions for reaction to take place, thus increasing the rate of reaction. Okay, so the easiest thing is, uh, the things you have to remember rather, um, first, the rate of reaction increases, why? Since the temperature increases, temperature increases. When the temperature is increased, the average kinetic energy of the molecules increases, uh, or the average uh, kinetic energy of the particle increases. When the average kinetic energy of the particle increases, the probability of collision be, uh, or successful collisions occurring between the particles for reaction to occur increases. And when the probability increases, uh, the overall rate of reaction increases. So moving ahead in part two, it says describe and explain using ideas about collision between particles, how the rate of reaction changes when larger pieces of iron are used. All other conditions are the same. So remember, when we have to increase the rate of reaction, increase the rate of reaction uh, of any uh, reaction, you basically use powdered form or uh, uh, of uh, the solute uh, generally, or these uh, salts or the metals and because that increases the overall surface area uh, to increase the more number of successful collisions for reaction to take place. But in if you are using a solid or large chunk of metal, uh, that will overall reduce the overall uh, effective area that is available for particles to collide and increase the rate of reaction. So this, if you're using a solid, this basically decreases the overall rate of reaction in this case. So let's see. Let's see all, so let's write it. So first thing, the rate of reaction 
decreases. Why? Uh, the particles of iron are less exposed to the reactants the overall surface area available for successful collisions uh so area required uh really available for successful collision decreases resulting in slower reaction rates okay so this is how the answer would look like so moving ahead it says uh, in part c calculate the maximum volume in decimeter cube of hydrogen form when 3.6 3.36 grams of iron react with excess dilute uh, with sorry with excess dilute sulfuric acid at room temperature and pressure give your answer to three significant figures okay so remember we have to uh, use this law pv is equal to nrt okay um, so this is the law we are using and we have to find out the uh, volume so volume will be equal to n r t divided by p so this is the law we are going will be going to use uh, so when we are giving this much gram of iron and so iron is in uh, the, is the limiting reactant so we'll be using this number of moles so if you're going to see from the equation earlier so one mole of iron will result in one mole of hydrogen gas uh, to be produced okay so let's see oh. so from here equation one mole of iron gives one mole of H2 gas. Okay, so for three, so we have to find number of moles of iron. This will be three, the mass in gram of iron divided by MR or that is equal to 56 uh, and this is 0 0.06 moles of iron. So one mole gives one mole, so 0 0.06 moles of Fv gives dash moles of H2 gas. So what are these moles? These moles are actually one mole is giving one mole, and so 0 0.06 will give you 0 0.06 moles of H2. Okay. So now we have number of moles of gas. So remember the value of R is 0 0.0821. We'll be using this value, number of moles N of hydrogen 0 0.06, temperature, use room temperature. Uh, room temperature is 273 plus 25 degree centigrade. Uh, so you, this is 298 Kelvin and uh, pressure is 1 N. So this is room temperature and pressure conditions. Uh, so what we get here, so volume, volume A will be 0 0.06 multiplied by 0 0.081 multiplied by 298 Kelvins divided by one. This comes out to be 1.4679 decimeter cube. So remember we have to give it to three significant figures. So the good answer will be one, seven rounded off to nearest three 
Okay, so this will be your answer. The best answer for this case. So that's how you solve this. Always remember this value uh, and this, and remember this is a, in moles. This pressure is in ATM and this value is in degree Kelvins. So next part, uh, part number D, uh, it says concentrated sulfuric acid is an oxidizing agent. This is why test for oxidizing agent. So test for oxidizing agent, uh, add uh, potassium uh, iodide in a test tube containing H2SO4. So add uh, potassium iodide, or you call it Ki in a test tube containing uh, H2SO4 or it's always good to write sulfuric acid. <laughs> uh, observation, remember uh, potassium iodide or, or the solution it becomes colorless. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, so actually, the potassium iodide is colorless solution and uh, with this reaction taking place, uh, uh, the reaction between Ki and H2SO4, the iodide salt will be released and that will uh, actually make the solution go brown. So the colorless solution of Ki when Added to colorless, uh, or you can say a uh, colorless solution or the colorless, colorless mixture okay. colorless mixture will turn brown. Basically, the color mixture of Ki and H2SO4 will turn Okay, so moving ahead, uh, question number four. Question number four uh, is related to organic chemistry. It says, uh, alkenes are homologous series of hydrocarbons. Alkenes are produced by cracking. State the meaning, uh, state, uh, the meaning of the term cracking. So remember the cracking is breaking down of larger chain hydrocarbons into, sm into smaller or shorter chain hydrocarbons by applying heat. Okay, so let's write it. It is the process of breaking down larger chain hydrocarbons or on alkanes into smaller slash shorter chain hydrocarbons by application of heat okay that's how it is uh, question then question number four part b it says margarine is manufactured from vegetable oils using nickel catalyst name one other reactant used in this reaction so this is hydrogen gas this is a hydrogenation process hydrogen gas is used then part two, it says, state the type of chemical reaction which occurs when margarine is manufactured from vegetable oils. So this is actually the addition reaction. Addition reaction. Okay. Um, so moving ahead, uh, it says, uh, see, ethanol is produced by reaction of ethene with steam. Ethene with steam constructed equation for this reaction. So ethene 
C2, H4 is ethene, okay, and steam is H2. When they react together, they form ethanol. So ethanol is C2H5OH. Okay. So let's balance this two and oh sorry, four and two, six, five and six, one O oh, one O oh, two comes. So this is balanced equation. Okay. This is how the equation will look like. Then part D it says organic compound contains 54% carbon, 9%. 9.1% hydrogen and 36.4% oxygen by mass. Calculate the empirical formula of the compound. So consider it as such carbon ratio, hydrogen ratio, oxygen. So the first part, uh, percentages, so write the percentages by mass. So carbon is 54.5, this is 9.1, and this is the ratio. 36.4. Then uh, let's call it divide by atomic mass, mass of each element. So 54.5 is divided by 12, 9.1 is divided by 1, and then 36.4 is divided by 16. Value comes out to be 5.4.5 or 1. We get 9.1, then we get 2.275. So now divide by least value. So let's divide by 4.5, 1 divided by 2.275. We should 9.1 divided by 2.275, and then 2.275 divided by 2.275. So when we divide these values, this value comes out to be equal to 2, this value comes out to be equal to 4, and this value comes out to be equal to 1. So the empirical formula will be C2, H4, and O as it is. Um, this will be our C formula, so let's write it as C2, H4, O. This will be our empirical formula for this case. So, moving ahead, uh, question number five. It says magnesium undergoes oxidation when it reacts with aqueous sil silver nitrate. So this is the reaction that is given. Explain how the equation shows the magnesium is oxidized. So remember oxygen is loss of electrons. So magnesium loses two electrons, becomes to positive. Uh, so magnesium loses two electrons and becomes Mg2 positive ion. Okay. Then uh, part B, it says reaction of magnesium with silver nitrate is exothermic. Okay. To complete the energy profile for this reaction, label the reactants, products, and delta H. Reactants, products, and delta H. So remember, in the exothermic re reaction, the energy is released to the uh, environment and the overall re energy of the uh, reactant or of the products is much less than the energy of the reactants. For example, if my energy of reactants is somewhere here, my react will products will be somewhere here. This will be my products. This will be my reactants. So the energy levels will become, and the reaction will take something like this. So the overall reactant profile will look something like this. So this will be the, you can say energy or EA, you can call it as EA and this is the energy that is delta H. Delta H, energy released 
and this is EA. So EA is your activation energy. Energy, and that basically the energy required to ensure the reactants, uh, the reaction starts taking place, and delta H equal to energy released to the surrounding or during the reaction. Okay. So this is how it goes. So moving ahead, part C, it says uh, acid acidified aqueous silver nitrate uh, added to a solution containing halide ions, a yellow precipitate uh, is observed. So remember, uh, so name an iodide name uh, of the halide ion present in the source. Remember silver uh, uh, iodide is actually yellow in color. Uh, so halides are generally fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, estrogen. These are halide ions. So remember halide ions are fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, estrogen. So these are the halide ions. So, so generally, uh, what we are uh, available, uh, silver chloride, silver bromide, and silver iodide. Name the iodide present in the salt. So it's a yellow precipitate. So generally, yellow precipitate is AGI or you can call it uh, iodide ion. Not light like this. It's simply iodide ion. Ion active. Uh, so remember how you can go with solving these. Uh, so I would just recommend that while uh, during studying this course, you always uh, make a list of uh, ions and uh, these salts and these reactions and remember some of these uh, things by heart because they it will come in seriously handy while solving these exams. Uh, uh, or you should always have a cheat sheet with you so that before going to an exam, just uh, go over it, revise it, and uh, go to the exam. Then part D, uh, silver silver is a metal. Use your knowledge of the structure of metal lines to explain why silver is malleable. Remember, mal uh, metal layers generally contain layer of atoms and the when applied, when and when some force is applied, these metal layers can slide over one another. That is what makes it malleable. So remember, um, let's write it, and you can always write it on your words. Metal uh, contains layers of atoms. Ions that can slide over each other when hammered or pressed. This make this make them malleable okay so this is how we go with it so moving ahead uh, question 5 part e it says the table gives information about thermal decomposition of some metal carbonates describe how the ease of thermal decomposition depends on the position of these metal in the reactivity series. So, generally, uh, ease of thermal decomposition, uh, so metal combination, ease of uh, calcium carbonate, then magnesium carbonate, and then sodium carbonate. Sodium is 
So in the reactivity series, uh, we have first of all sodium, then magnesium. No, sorry, sodium, uh, potassium, calcium, magnesium. Sodium, potassium, calcium, magnesium. Sodium, uh, then potassium, then calcium, then magnesium. So we see sodium at 1000 degrees centigrade, calcium no delta is given, oh sorry, potassium no delta uh, given, calcium, calcium 900 degrees degree centigrade. So higher in the reactivity series, it is more difficult uh, to decompose. Describe how the ease of thermal. So you can say more reactive carbonates or higher in reactivity are difficult to decompose. Okay. For example, sodium requires thousand degrees centigrade. Sodium, which is high, high in series, requires one thousand degrees centigrade compared to magnesium which is low in series which requires 540 degrees centigrade okay so even the first line is fine more uh, or re more reactive carbonates or carbonates which are higher in reactivity series are difficult to decompose compared to the ones which are low in the reactivity series. Question number six. Question number six states uh, that uh, chlorine reacts with phosphorus to form phosphorus three chloride. Three Cl2 plus two P because two P Cl3. Reaction is exothermic in nature. To explain in terms of bond breaking and bond formation, why reaction is exothermic. So remember, bond breaking is endothermic and bond formation is exothermic. So bond breaking is endothermic and bond formation is exothermic. So during this, chlorine chlorine bonds are breaking and PCl3 bonds are forming. So overall, the energy released in making the bonds is more than the energy absorbed while breaking the bonds. Hence, the reaction will be exothermic. So, first of all, right bond breaking is an endothermic process bond formation is an exothermic process during this reaction the energy released in making
making PCL bonds is more than the energy absorbed in breaking the CL, CL or the chlorine double bonds. You can also call it chlorine double Okay, so this is how it, it is done. Then part B, question number one, it says, when chlorine reacts with aqueous potassium iodide, a brown solution is formed. Name the product of this reaction. So remember, chlorine plus Ki is KCl plus I2. The product is potassium chloride. One is potassium chloride and the brown thing is the bromine gas. Gas, bromine itself. Okay, name the products of this reaction. So moving ahead, when aqueous bromine is added to potassium chloride, there is no reaction. Why there is no reaction? Because uh, bromine is less reactive than chlorine. So it can't displace chlorine from its salt. Whereas vice versa has happened. So just simply write as chlorine is reactive then bromine bromine cannot replace chlorine from its salt in a chemical reaction. Okay, this is very simple. Then phosphorus 3 chloride, PCL3, reacts with water to form a mixture of phosphoric acid, H3PO3 and hydrochloric acid. Construct the equation. So remember, uh, PCL3, we know the thing reacts with water. So I just add H2O. The products are all given to you. H3PO3 plus HCl hydrochloric acid. So now all you have to do is to balance this equation. So chlorine is three. So we are um, only one here. So let's add three here. So three, if we add three here, see what it goes. So hydrogen is three, three plus three, six. We have, we need six hydrogen. So two, just add three. So P is one, P is one, H is three and three, six, six is six. Uh, oxygen is three, oxygen is three. So this is balanced now, okay? So this is very simple. Do not get uh, confused or afraid by just looking at that. You have to write this equation. Just read it twice. You are given the products. So you know the symbol of hydrochloric acid and water, I assume that you are well versed enough to remember the um, uh, what H2 stands for or what HCl stands for, okay? So this basically uh, constitutes our section number A. And remember in section A, we have to attempt all the questions. So now uh, section B, in the section B, we are required to attempt three questions. Uh, in the space provided, so the total mark for the section is 30. And actually we're given four questions and I'm not that lucky enough here to solve three questions for you. So I'll be solving all the fours for you. And uh, so let's start. Um, question number seven, part. It says the question is about metals and metal compounds, part A. It says silver is a transition element. Uh, potassium is a metal in group one of the periodic table, okay? Say two differences in physical properties of silver and potassium. So remember these are 
we're talking about physical properties. Uh, physical properties, uh, you can say silver is harder than potassium. Potassium, silver has uh, high density. Silver has high density. Then potassium, again, this is a physical property. Um, high melting point. Silver has high melting point. Silver has high boiling point. Alpha has I mean, then then potassium. Okay, so these are some of the properties. I'll just simply go with one, two, and three. Okay. So um part B, seven B, it says silver ion has a symbol AG plus one oh nine forty seven deduce the number of protons, neutrons, and electrons in this ion. So number of protons, so this is the protons, um, neutrons. Uh, so if this 109 minus 47 will give you neutrons. Okay. And number of electrons is equal to number of protons in an element, but this is an ion. So ion is electrons is minus one. So you have to do minus one here. So let's see. So number of protons, 47. Number of neutrons, so 109 minus 47 will be equal to 62, the number of neutrons. And number of electrons, so 47 minus one, 46. Because it is an ion, it has lost one electron. Uh, potassium, um, part C now reacts with water to form gas, which pops a splinted, lighted splint. So remember, pops uh, a splint, a uh, lighted splint uh, is something that is not oxygen. Oxygen recancels it, not pops it. So the gas is actually hydrogen gas. So H2 will come here. Now we have to balance it. Um, so H2 is here. 2K, K is 2, so let me write 2 here. So H2, H2, but H is 3. So, or no, 4. So it comes 2 here. 2, O, 2, O, K, 2, 2. So now this is balanced, okay? Now this is how it is. Um, then uh, part D, it says, when zinc carbonate is warmed in a closed container, an equilibrium mixture is formed. We have zinc carbonate in solid. Uh, heated zinc oxide, carbon dioxide gas. So now we have to explain why the reaction is endothermic. Describe and explain the effect, if any, on the position of equilibrium. Um, sorry, uh, the forward reaction is endothermic. So this is your forward reaction. So it is endothermic on the position of equilibrium when the temperature is decreased. So if I decrease the temperature, so remember also remember that the forward reaction is endothermic and the reverse reaction is exothermic. So forward reaction uh, and it is also endothermic. So the reverse reaction is exothermic. So what will happen if temperature is going to increase the Reaction will move in reverse slash backward direction. Okay. This is causes more reactant will be formed then the 
products. Decreasing. Temperature increases the rate of exothermic reaction. because it will be uh, the direction of releasing energy. Uh, direction of releasing energy. Okay. So then, oh, sorry. Part two, it says describe and explain the effect if any, on the possible equilibrium when the concentration of carbon dioxide is increased. So again, uh, if you are going to remember, uh, it is the reaction is ZNO, sorry, zinc carbonate, ZNO C2. Zinc carbonate, uh, mm -hmm. CO3. ZNO plus CO2, something like this, yes. And this is your endothermic reaction. So if uh, the concentration of carbon dioxide is increased, the reaction will move in the backward direction and more react uh, reactants will be produced in order to compensate for the increase in concentration till the, so reverse reaction is increased Uh, so the reaction moves in the backward direction more reactant will be produced the reaction follows backward reverse direction to compensate the increased concentration of CO2 till the equilibrium is achieved, okay? So remember, uh, whether you increase the temperature or increase the concentration on one side, uh, the reaction will always uh, follow a path that will move the reaction to its equilibrium state, okay? So now, uh, moving to the next question, question number eight, it says the structure of an angelic acid is shown. Wow, it's interesting. Um, so explain how this structure shows that angelic acid is an unsaturated compound. So remember, if there is a carbon-carbon double bond, remember again, carbon-carbon double bond, not carbon-oxygen, not carbon-hydrogen, carbon-carbon double bond, then it is an unsaturated compound. Double bond or triple bond, anyone. So the structure contains carbon-carbon 
डबल बॉन्ड ऑफ कार्बन so this is how it shows that it's an unsaturated group of bond it says do you deduce the molecular formula of angelic acid okay so calculate all the elements so we have c we have h we have o so let's come 1 2 3 4 5 c 3 4 5 6 7 8 so we have 8 h we have one two two o's so this is the uh, molecular formula c5 h8 o2 so this is the molecular formula you can write it as yes and remember uh, since this is a weak acid so remember if it's a weak acid the acids are generally C O O H. So one H comes here, two O come here, one C come here. So we are left with C four and H seven. So this is uh, the best, the actual molecular formula of the angelic acid. So, and this we can always deduce from the next uh, part. in the question because they have said it it's a weak acid but we do not know it here but you can also if you are going to write something like this it will be perfectly fine but remember uh, organic acids are are compounds with cooh um, bonds or cooh thing so define the term acid so remember acid is uh molecular compound that donates a proton or accepts an electron pair in a chemical reaction okay also also oh, sorry also we can say that um for an acid of uh, a solution which contains hydrogen ions or hydrogen donor ions is also contains hydrogen ions or or donor ions or in some textbooks you can always say uh, find that uh, is it the solution that reacts with a base to form a salt and a water something like that but again uh, these two are good definitions for acid so i will go with it then part 2 it says define oh sorry explain the meaning of the term weak as it applies to acid so You can just simply say the acid that does that does not uh, completely ionizes when added to an aqueous solution. For example, water is a weak acid. Uh, the acid that does not completely ionizes when added to aqueous solutions for example water okay so these are weak acids and generally 
in uh, the organic acids are weak acids. Okay. Then part D, it says angelic acid can be polymerized. State the name, state the name of the type of polymerization that occurs. So when you're going to polymerize the angelic acid, uh, it is the addition reaction or addition polymerization. This addition polymerization. Then it says draw the partial structure of the polymeric angelic acid. Show two units. So remember, polymeric acid uh, or angelic acid was C4H7COOH. So and carbon carbon double bond was there. So carbon. So it was something like this: carbon carbon double bond. Uh, COH, CH3, HCH3, okay. So this was COOH here, CH3, CH3, and H here. This one was the structure, okay. This one was the structure. So when you're going to polymerize it, the structure in, remains should remain the same. So COOH will here, this double bond will be removed. CH3 will come here. CH3 will come here. H will come here. This will be here. This will be here, okay? Then, so this is your one unit. Now, just add another unit here. C, then single bond C, CH3 here. COOH here. CH3 here. H here, then another structure. So this is your second structure. So this is one unit. This is two unit, unit two. And actually, it goes one, two, three, one, two, three. And you just have an N shape here. So this is N number of uh, structures or N number of units. So one unit, this is another one unit. So not two units, just call it as one unit. So this carry on and you'll have a, a good a partial structure of the polymer, the angelic acid. Then uh, in part E, it says angelic acid reacts with methanol. So remember, an acid reacts with a alcohol to form an ester. Easter, you can call ester. Completely uh, complete the structure of this east ester to show the atoms and all the bonds. Okay, so CH3. Remember C4H7 COOH plus CH3OH. So ester will be, uh, you can say, this plus this, okay? And rest will be H2O plus H2O will be here. So first unit will be coming from C4H7CO and then reverse of this, OCH3, something like this. Okay, so now let's see. Uh, so we are with CH3 here. H, C, CH3 here. C, then O. And uh, this, not, not, not O. Uh, so how many carbon we have? So we have to add. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven H and one, two, three, four. So we have to add this thing to this structure, C O C H three. So we'll have C here. It goes with a double bond with an oxygen atom. And then O C H three. It would be something similar to like this. So this will be your structure or the remaining structure for the master. Then it says construct a complete um, 
equation or a, so com construct the equation for the complete combustion of methanol. So methanol CH3, CH3, OH. So this is methanol. Combustion, remember, you use oxygen. If you burn methanol, you pr produce carbon dioxide plus water. Any organic compound, carbon dioxide plus water. Complete combustion results in this. So now you have to just simply balance this out. Okay, so let's see. Uh, o is one, O is two, and three. So three O and we have one O. So if we're going to add three here, oxygen will be six. So if I add three here, oxygen will be three, and uh, hydrogen will be six. So H will be four. Uh, and six, if I add two, three, four, I will not be having six. So if I add two here, for example, uh, how would it look? Uh, two C, two C, two C, let's say two, if I add two here, two, two, four, and four oxygen, one, five, two, four, and four, okay? And uh, H will be, Six, seven, eight. So let me add four, four, and four, eight. So this will be three. Okay, now this thing is balanced. So this is how you balance it. So remember, it will take a little while, but it is not difficult if you know the reactants and the products. So if you know the reactants and you are sure about the products, the equation will always balance out. Okay, so next, moving ahead. So it's the question number uh, <clears throat> nine. In question number nine, it says, uh, in this question is about ammonia and its nitrates or about, and about nitrates. You state, state the source of hydrogen and nitrogen used in the manufacture of ammonia by the Haber process. Source of oxygen, hydrogen is again, comes from the cracking of hydrocarbons and source of nitrogen is air. So call it as cracking of hydrocarbons. And this is because, because of fractional distillation of air. Okay. So moving ahead uh, in part B, it says ammonia is formed when an aqueous ammonium sulfate is heated with sodium, sodium hydroxide. Okay, the student adds 4.5 grams of sodium hydroxide to 50 centimeter cube of one mole per decimeter cube of aqueous sodium hydroxide or aqueous sodium sulfate. Show calculation of ammonium sulfate so that, show by calculation that ammonium sulfate is in excess. Okay, so let's simply add, uh, calculate the number of moles. So first of all, number of moles of of ammonium sulfate ammonium sulfate so ammonium sulfate is a 50 centimeter cube of 1.25 mole per dm cube so the concentration is 1.25 moles per, so remember, one decimeter cube is 1,000 centimeter cube. So 1,000 centimeter cube multiplied by 50 centimeter cube will give you the actual 0 0.0625 moles of now. So this is number of moles. So again, now number of moles of the other reactant uh, that is sodium hydroxide. Sodium hydroxide. Sodium hydroxide. Um, so 4.5 grams, 4.5 divided by sodium hydroxide. So molecular mass 23 plus 16 plus 1 
this comes out to be uh, 17, 30, 40. So 40, uh, it, it is equal to 0 0.1125 moles. So 26 plus 16 plus 1, 0, 140. Yeah, we are right. We're good. So calculation is right. So here, what is happening? So we have one mole of ammonium sulfate, NH4, SO4 reacts with one mole of NaOH, okay? To give whatever, uh, so no, sorry, reacts with two moles of this. So if my sodium hydroxide is uh, 0.1125 moles, uh, then uh, what I need is a maximum of two into 0.1125 moles of uh, ammonium sulfate. So if, if I, my ammonium sulfate is more than that, then that is the amount of excess we have, XX moles. So moles of available 0 0.1125 moles of NH4, SO4, used in a reaction, that will be 0 0.1125 divided by two. And uh, this will be uh, 0 0.0625 moles or uh, let me calculate it 0 0.1125 so we have we will require 0 0.05625 moles number of moles used so extra Extra will be uh, 0 0.0625 minus 0 0.0565. This will give me around 6.25, 10 to power minus 3 moles. These are the in access. Access. So now, molecular mass of NH4 to SO4. I have to calculate it. So to calculate the ammonium uh, sulfate in excess, so this is actually the, uh, the amount of uh, uh, or the moles which are available in excess. And if you're going to multiply with the molecular mass of this, so then it would be nitrogen will be 14 plus hydrogen 4 multiply by 2 plus uh, oxygen multiply by 4 plus sulfur is check the periodic table for you sulfur is uh, 32 32 <clears throat> so this is what we get total so let us add all of these together so 14 plus 4 multiply by 2 plus 16 into 4 plus 32. So this will be 132 and amount in grams, which is in excess. 6.25 into 10 to power minus 3 multiplied by 132. 
that by 6.25. Or it is this is eight twenty five milligrams. Okay, this is <clears throat> what you will get in excess. Or if you are going to write as six point two five moles of sodium hydroxide in excess, this will also serve as good answer as well. But if you are going to write it an <clears throat> amount in grams, that is also fine. Okay. So moving ahead in part C, it says when dilute sodium hydroxide is electrolyzed, the hydroxide ions are converted to oxygen and water at the anode. Write the ionic equation for this reaction taking place at the anode. So remember at anode, uh, so sodium hydroxide is electrolyzed, NaOH, this is a reversible reaction. Uh, Again, uh, plus H2 is also there. So H positive plus OH negative. So remember, at anode, these OH negative ions will be going. Neg ne negative ions, they will uh, lose some electrons and water will be formed plus oxygen gas will be released. So oh, four, yes, four. <clears throat> so this is how it will look like. Okay. Then uh, at part D, this first stage of the reaction, first stage for test of nitrate ion is to heat aluminum and sodium hydroxide in solution containing nitrate ions. State the type of chemical reaction which occurs when solution containing nitrate ions is heated with aluminum and sodium hydroxide. So this type of reaction is just simply um, it's a redox reaction, so it's a reduction process. Not a redox reaction, it's a just a simple reduction reaction. Okay, so then in part E, uh, uh, it says nitrates from fertilizers called eutrophication when they leached from soil into the liver. Describe the process of eutrophication. So remember, this is a three point question, so at least you have to. Uh, uh, focus on three points. So remember it is a eutrophication is a gradual increase in concentration of uh, phosphorus, nitrogen, and other these nutrients in an aging aquatic ecosystem. Uh, so overall the productivity of fertility or productivity or overall fertility of such an ecosystem increases with this uh, reaction. Uh, uh, it, it results in growth in plant and algae. Uh, plants on surface block sunlight, reach below the water, resulting in that of the underwater plants. Um, bacteria feeds upon these plants, resulting in consumption of oxygen from water. This causes organisms and fish to die. And that is why uh, these are some of the challenges uh, for eutrophication when it happens in freshwater lakes, especially. Mm, so um, let's... Uh, so eutrophication, uh, it is a process which results in increased growth of Water plants and algae because of gradual increase in concentration of phosphorus nitrogen and other 
nutrients in aquatic ecosystem you can call it so what this does um, so these um, this enhanced growth of algae slash plants on water surface blocks sunlight penetration resulting in death or resulting in under water plants the bacteria then feeds on these plants consuming oxygen which further results in death of fish thereby damaging aquatic ecosystem okay so this is what a uh, eutrophication process is basically these nitrates and all these nutrients when leached into the water they do all sorts of things to the you know freshwater lakes or the water ecosystem or aquatic ecosystem and this is why um, although this may result in some uh, benefits but it also damages the aquatic system in a bigger context okay so this is how we solve this then uh, question number 10 or the last question for this exam so this question is uh, uh, it says that uh, this question is about the elements in in group 4 of the periodic table the table shows some properties of group 4 elements um, is element and density, melting point, boiling point. Uh, we have carbon, silicon, germanium, tin, light. Predict the density of tin. Okay. So density of tin, uh, any value between 5.35 and 11.34. I say 8 grams per centimeter. That's fine. Okay. Uh, predict the density of tin. So I have written eight grams per centimeter cube. And just make sure your value is somewhat more. Um, so another way is 11.34 plus 5.35 divided by two. Just get a number. Make sure you are on the higher end of this number. Um, so let's say 11.34 plus 5.35 divided by 2, 8.35, uh, sorry, 8.345. So anything in this ballpark or not on the higher end, I'm a little on the lower side. So my estimate was, uh, okay. So anything around this will be good. Uh, uh, then mm, describe the general trend in boiling points of group four elements. So the, as we go down the group, the boiling point uh, germanium 
then it decreases. No. So, boiling point. So, group. So, as we group four, carbon, silicon, germanium. Group four is carbon, silicon, germanium, tin, and lead. So, overall, the boiling point uh, decreases except for germanium um, which is an exception overall um, in the general trend the boiling point decreases as we go down the group predict the state of silicon at 1600 degree centigrade so silicon melting point is 1450 at 1600 degrees in molten form so liquid the silicon melts at Six, um, 14, 10 degrees centigrade and boils at 235, 2355 degrees centigrade. So at 1600 degrees centigrade, it will be in liquid state okay so the temperature is greater than the uh, melting point but less than the boiling point or also write as temperature less than boiling point but greater than melting point you can also write that okay next part question number uh, 10 part b it says the structure of give a structure of uh, uh, this compound p and q so oxygen silicon and chlorine are the atoms here um, so this is my silicon this is my chlorine, this is chlorine, this is chlorine, this is chlorine. Okay. So explain the structure and bonding why compound P has high melting and uh, melting point and compound Q has a low melting point. Okay, so remember the compound Q, uh, P has a more of a latest sort of structure whereas compound C is a simple molecular structure. And the size small in size, whereas the size of a lattice is fine, and it is also exhibiting strong uh, covalent bonding between three elements, where are there are uh, weak covalent bonding between two. So uh, overall, let's let's write uh, for compound P the compound has a oh, giant I have returned giant has a giant molecular structure latest I would say latest structure The structure exhibits strong bonds between three elements 
means across the lattice which makes the melting point higher compared to Q where we have only two elements. Similarly, we come down to um, I'm writing here uh, let me write from here for for Q. You can say uh, compound as simple molecular formula uh, molecular not I would say molecular simple molecular structure okay and is small in size compared to P. Also, you can write uh, the covalent bonds between silicon and chlorine are weak thus makes the melting point low compared Okay, so this is uh, on a molecular uh, level, on a structural level, we can write it something like this to, uh, to get our two points. The key thing is, if we have a giant la uh, molecular latest sort of structure, that that sort of compound will have much higher uh, uh, melting point uh, compared to a compound which has a very low or which has a very simplistic sort of structure. There is no latest available, less number of atoms or less number of atoms or elements uh, uh, present. Uh, so, uh, so generally uh, I would write instead of elements better used atoms here, it would look more decent world for this case. So again, if we focus on these two points, for one compound and the similarly for second compound, we'll be getting our four points uh, for this case. So then part two, it says draw a dot and cross structure for a molecule <clears throat> for a molecule of compound Q. Molecule compound SiCl4. So remember, uh, silicon. Silicon have four valence electrons and chlorine as one valence electron okay um, so outer shell electrons so remember uh, silicon and it is not uh, so it is more of a uh, it is it, and actually it's a gas uh, so it is a more of a molecule thing so so silicon will have, uh, let's call silicon electron is as this and chlorine electron as with a cross. So let me draw some bigger silicon. So this is my silicon. Uh, I have 
one silicon atom here, one silicon atom here between. So my four silicon valence electrons be shared by four chlorine atoms. So it will be. So this will be Cl. More chlorine here. So uh, more chlorine will be here. So three chlorine will be here. So four chlorine will be here. And similarly, the chlorine valence. Uh, so sorry, seven in the valence cell. My bad. So seven in the valence cells, you have one cross, one here, one here, one here, two, four, six, and one seven. Something like this will be the structure. Something like this. Something like this. Something like this will be the structure for chlorine. Okay. Remember, this is a gas, it's a compound, it's not an ionic. Uh, Bond or something. That's why it's an overlapping of uh, these orbitals or these shells will be overlapped where the electrons will be there. Then uh, it says, or the last question of this paper, the compound of carbon, hydrogen, silicon has a formula of this. Calculate the percentage by mass of carbon in this compound. So sim simply a uh, molecular mass of the compound it will be silicon silicon is 28 plus carbon 12 plus hydrogen 3 and both are multiplied by 4 so it is 88 so percentage of carbon by mass so carbon is 12 multiplied by 4 divided by 88 into 100 as percent. This comes out to be 48 divided by 88 multiplied by 100 percent. And this is 54.545 percent. That is your answer. Okay. So that's it. Uh, I hope. Uh, you have uh, 